Ed Rowley. Good day, everybody. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we begin this morning, I want to I want to share a slide with you. This slide that begins our story of where we are, and it says, "When we put our cares in God's hands, He puts His peace in our hearts." This statement, I think, is great medicine for us in a troubled nation today. So many people have been running around trying to resolve all their personal professional issues and concerns on their own. So I want us to stop before we begin our, the main core of our message today and remember whose world this is. Is it our world? Did we create it? I think we can emphatically say no. So how much control do we have? How much control do we have over everything around us? On a scale of one to ten, maybe a one on the outside of two, right? The only real control we have is over ourselves. So when the world seems to have lost its mind, and oftentimes I think it has in the last months, it's time for us to get control of ourselves and our relationship with Christ and Christ alone. So I want you to join me now as we put our cares in God's hands so we can hear God's message today. So I want you to reach out your hands. I want you to form a cup with your hands like this. And now as you have your cup, I want you to put your cup like this up above you and I want you to say, Lord, here are all my cares. Here are all my concerns. Here are all my frustrations, my pains, and my hurts. I give to you now. I lay them before you right now. I can no longer carry these burdens, these issues that I've been trying to carry that's been weighing so hard on my heart, my mind, and my soul. Let's lift up the cup to God and give the cup to God right now. Let us burst the cup and let them fly in the arms of God right now. That we may feel his peace that passes all understanding. And I think sometimes our hearts have to be ready so we can hear what God has to say to us and what we need to hear from God. And so let us put all our cares in God's hands today and open up our hearts and minds to what he needs for us as we live out our faith. And it's a perfect segue into third John where we are this morning that he needs our hearts ready. He needs our hearts ready so we can minister to where God needs us to minister, that we may be able to hear what God needs us to hear. So as we turn to the next slide of John, 3 John 1, 1, 5, it writes, Dear friends, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. Wow! In order to be faithful, we have to have a clean heart, as I just told you, a clean mind and soul to respond to what John is saying to us here in the text. In case you can't forgot, last week John once again affirmed his audience by telling them personally how proud he was. And again, here in 3 John 1 5, again he says, Dear friend and faithful. He begins by calling you friend, or as some texts refer to, beloved. Isn't that a wonderful compliment that John gives to us? He calls us his friend and he calls us beloved. He and he's complimenting a member of the faith named Gaius for his intentional actions that he had been witnessing toward the body of Christ and those even outside the body. What he calls faithful and refers to Gaius as being one who is doing the faithful thing. One who has become a faithful believer in Christ. And in all his actions, he calls beneficence and charity, and he acted the upright part, John says. And I thought about those words, beneficence, and how powerful those words are. And, and, and the word beneficence is one who acts with personal qualities of mercy, personal qualities of kindness, of generosity, and charity. And when you think about when John says this to Gaius, He's reminding or suggesting to us the altruism, love, humanity, and a promoting of the good 
of others. And that's where Gaius was in the early church, promoting the best in others. In ordinary language, we need to understand that we too have to see ourselves as lifting up others and not tearing them down. So John sees this in Gaius, and he saw it not as a hypocritical pretend, but an authenticity of who he was and a principle that spoke of love for his fellow brothers and sisters of the faith. And maybe beginning where we began here this morning with the message by turning ourselves over to God, enables us to seek the direction of John's audience for the glory of God. And I really think that's where John has gone this morning for us, is he goes to the glory of God. In fact, look at the next verse, what he says in verse 6. He says, They have testified about your love before the assembly. You will do well to send them forward on their journey in a way worthy of God. And this is verse picks up on what, what John just brought about, about what he said about Gaius, about friend and being faithful. Here we take this text personally, that John's talking to you and I face to face. And to allow, allow me to make a simple question of what John is in, in, implying here. He says, he says, who has testified about your love for Jesus recently? Think about that. Who has testified about your love for Jesus recently? Who has let others know how much you love Jesus, how much you have a great relationship with Christ? And I thought about this compliment that he offers up to Gaius about they have testified about your love before the assembly. And I began to wonder, who has testified about my love? Who has testified about our love as a congregation, as a people of God? Who has testified about our love for Christ? And I wonder how much more powerful might the message of the church of Jesus Christ be if we were all testifying to the works of faith that each one is doing? What if the church was proffering up one another about what they were doing in Christ? What if the world and our immediate communities around us could hear Christians proffering up each other rather than tearing one another down? Because in our society today, it seems like one side is tearing the other side down for one reason or another, and that's got to stop. we got to listen to what John is telling us, that we need to proffer each other up in Christ's name. Not only that sentiment of lifting one another up, but that... The message on the road that others hear is that the church is a good place, that Christ is a powerful entity. And I wonder how can we begin to proffer up other churches? How can we begin to proffer up other people in Christ? How do we do that? I thought, well, there's some simple ways. Don't take a lot of energy. They just take your computer. Maybe you go on Twitter and say a really kind thing about the neighboring church. Or maybe you go on YouTube and do a quick little spiel on a church or somebody in Christ that you know. Or maybe you go on Facebook and you go to someone's page and say, hey, I love what you're doing in Christ's name. Or you go on TikTok and you do a little recording. Or you go on Instagram and show a great picture and say, this is a great ministry. Or you maybe just email some people and say, ah, I love what you're doing in Christ's name. And I got to think about how often do we lift each other up in the church? How often do we lift up one another in the Christian community? And this is what John is getting at about Gaius. He's going and he's lifting up the church. He's, he's lifting up in faithfulness. He, he's, he's testifying about what others are doing in Christ. And I think that's really an important message we need to hear today because we've not done that well in the church. And those outside the church see the church calling and, 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 and ratifying certain elements of the church and saying, that part of church isn't good, that part of church isn't good. And they're not seeing the power and the message of Christ that needs to be proclaimed. I think this is why this message that John brings is so powerful for me today. And I think, what if we gave a positive shout out? about someone you know in Christ today? What if we gave even a shout out for the ministry of Good Shepherd and let people know what you think of Good Shepherd? Just think if we took John's message about Gaius testifying that how transformational that could be in the world today. How transformational that could be in our country today that is so divided, so lost with, this, with no understanding of bringing us a central concept of who we are anymore. I believe that is why John is so hyped up to, about the immediate audience and what they are doing for the body of Christ, and he, he, he gives them a shout out of their testimony. And I believe we can learn a great deal from this part of the letter of John today. They always say you draw more bees with honey. And I thought about that. And I got to ask myself the question, where is the honey in the church today? What kind of honey 
that you and I have that would draw others to the height of Christ. What leads us to the next, which leads us to the next verse, reminds us of the significance of having this honey. Having a honey that, like I thought of, when I thought about honey, I, I, I thought about Winnie the Pooh, and you think of the Winnie the Pooh cartoon, or whatever you want to call it, and you see Winnie the Pooh, and he's, when, when Christopher Robin often finds him, he's almost got his hand in the, in the honey in the tree, and it's dripping all over his hand and out of his lips. We need to have the honey of Christ almost dripping from our lips. The sweetness of who Christ is dripping from our lips. In fact, that's why this next verse becomes so critical. If we look to the next verse, verse 7 says, For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. This compliment we just heard, the most important part is they say, For they have gone out for the sake of the name, which is the name being Jesus. That the name of Jesus is on their lips. That the name of Jesus, the honey of Jesus, should be on our lips is what John is reminding us. But how many of us leave our, our worship places with Jesus on our lips? Are we determined, or are we determined to let people know who Jesus is in our lives? Or what does it take for us to share who Jesus is? What I found very interesting in this text and how it's written in Greek, the word translated here is, they have gone out for the sake of the name. Gone out for the sake of the name. And I wondered, what is, we never use the word sake. How often do we use the word sake in our vocabulary? We don't. So I looked it up. So out of the Greek, the word sake has four key words. I want you to hold on to these words because they matter for the rest of the message. There's cause. Account, interest, and benefit. Cause, account, interest, and benefit. These four words define the word sake. And so as I thought about it, I want you to hear clearly. I want you to stop and I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. Because this is really important. I want you to think deeply about what I'm going to say right now. Because this is important. If we're truly positive about who Christ is in our lives. Hear this. Do we think that Jesus is a cause worth talking about? Do we think that Jesus is a cause worth thinking about? Just think. Second, how might we make an accounting of Jesus in our lives that would reflect the impact he has on us? How might we make an accounting of Jesus in our lives that reflect the impact he has in our lives? Do we reveal to others that we have the slightest interest in Jesus? Do we reveal to others that we have the slightest interest in Jesus and that how that might make a difference in our lives? Fourth word, benefit. How much benefit do we see in living a life with Jesus? I repeat. How much benefit do we see in living a life with Jesus? You see, as I read this text, I began to understand the word sake. It hit me in a whole different way to understand what John's point is. For John is take, takes us to a place that we are walking the faith. He, John, knew the cause of what it meant to have Jesus in his life. John knew what it meant to account for having Jesus in his life. John knew the great interest in who Jesus was in the journey he lived. And John knew the benefit of having Jesus in his life. John wasn't worried about who was going to support the mission in the text. He says, don't worry about who's going to support us. But what he wants us to know is that Jesus is the word we have to get out. For his name's sake, we must share the good news, is what John is saying. And I began to really realize that as John said this to us, it says it in this text, that, that he knew the importance of his cause. And I mean his as in Jesus' cause. He also knew that his accounting of our sins on the cross was significant. 
He understood the interest in who Jesus was in his life and in the life of the church. And finally, he knew the benefit that we receive as the body of Christ from Jesus was so paramount. That we, today, no matter where you are, or whatever you're doing, if you're on video, if you're at home, or you're at the church today, that you have to understand that we need to leave here with his name sink in the depths of who we are. In fact, John doubles down, as he always seems to do, in the next verse, in verse 8, he says, We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Wow. What John's getting at here is, in other words, once we receive, once we receive in our hearts what Jesus has to offer, we need to be helpless in sharing this truth with the world. And then I got to be thinking about something that hit me as in the midst of the climate of our culture today and our country today. There are, a, there are campaigns going on across our country today, a political campaigns. It doesn't matter what party you're a part of. There are political campaigns going on that people are making life and death issues about. But I got to thinking, what's the most important campaign there is? And I thought about our claim as a nation years ago when we were missed in the throes of war, especially World War II, and the nation put out the campaign poster, Uncle Sam wants you. And I thought about that. And I thought about all the campaigning that's going on across our nation. And I realized there's a, a campaign that's more and than political. There's a campaign that's life and death. There's a campaign out there that's more important than any of the campaign slogans we can have. More than any campaign component we can have. There's a campaign going on in the life of the church. We need to put on a campaign, and we need to put it on today. Instead of wearing the crazy different hats, whether, whatever your campaign person is, I don't care because it doesn't matter to God. What matters is God's campaign that we have to put on. So today I'm going to ask you to put on the campaign for Jesus. We are putting on the campaign for Jesus. When I do my walks in the morning with my wife, I wear this hat. When I'm out in the community, I wear this hat, and it says Jesus. You see, the campaign that needs to occur today is about Jesus. It's not political, but it's life or death. John is saying here that Jesus wants and needs you right now. The challenge is, do we want to be Jesus' helpers? It takes us back to the previous verse. Are we prepared to be helpers for his name's sake? Do we see the importance of his cause? Do we see the importance of Jesus' cause in the world today, in our community today, in our nation today? You know, we love causes. We, we are, we're bombarded with causes, especially now. We get phone calls all 24 hours a day if we looked at our phone or our watches. We get calls for causes, but they're really not that important of a cause. The true cause is Jesus. We have to know that Jesus is our number one cause, and that's why it's so powerful and profound that it helps define for his name's sake. Do we understand that Jesus is our cause? And then the second part of it comes back to what we mentioned a few moments ago. Are we ready to make an account of who Jesus is in our life? Are we ready to be accountable to who Jesus is in my life? Does having Jesus in my life, does it, am I accountable to who Jesus is in my life? Am I willing and ready to make an account? Of who Jesus is in my life. The third word becomes, do we see the benefit of having Jesus in our life? Do we see the promise of the cross and the forgiveness of our sins at the foot of the cross and, and the promise of eternal life? But more importantly, the God has come into us. He stepped down out of, out of the heavenly valley. He enters into the worldly world of where we are right here, and he enters into our life. What a benefit it is to know that a God cares and reaches down and says, I love you. I don't care what a jerk you are. I love you. I don't care how messed up you are. I love you. And I take away all your sins. Do we understand the significance of that benefit? And then finally, and this is the one that really wrapped my brain. Doggone, folks. 
Do we have a personal interest in Jesus? Do we have a personal interest in sharing the message of Jesus? And I thought about the word interest, and it kind of struck me. And I do really begin to wonder, where in the church do we have an interest in who this Jesus is? And I think it's really important in the discussion to ask ourselves, do we really have an interest in who Jesus is in my life? And I thought it's really important if we have an interest, it'll show. And I've learned this very, very predominantly, both in my son and my daughter. One day I was <clears throat> looking at my daughter, and you, know, you all know she's an avid sports fan, and I asked her one day, I said, Danielle, why are you a sports fan? She said, Dad, duh. From the time I started going and attending school, and you would take me to school and take me, me out to take me home, only thing I read was sports talk radio. And on, when you had free time, what, the one thing you, won't, you only watched was sports. You, you enjoyed your Dodgers, you enjoyed your Kings, you enjoyed your Lakers, you enjoyed everything about sports. No wonder I love sports because you had such an interest in sports that it showed. And that's why I am today. And I look at my son, it's the same way. I watch my son mature as a, as a man, I watch him mature as a husband. And it's so cool. He's taken an interest in things that are really cool. He's taken a lot of interest in some of the things I love, but because I've shown an interest in those things, and I've shown an interest in who he is. So it's profound when we show an interest. When we show an interest, people will want to know and follow that interest. So the question is, do we understand the importance of Jesus' cause? Do we understand that the accountability of our relationship with Jesus matters? Do we understand the benefits of having Jesus in our lives? And do we have a true interest in who Jesus is that others want to follow that interest? Because I think that that's how it is. I think one of the greatest things we can do in evangelism is show an interest in who Christ is that others will see. That we can show the that is that we show the interest, we begin to show the benefit, we begin to show that that is a cause worth living for and worth dying for. I think that's really what it's about. And then it shows how accountable we are to that cause. Who Christ is. And that leads us to the final verse that I'm preaching on in verse 11, skip 9 and 10, because that's really stuff we can do in the Bible study, not in, not in the sermon. For he says in verse 11, he says, Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not even seen God. I thought it's a really great amplification of what John's been saying the whole time is that. Do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. If we're proffering up one another for the glory of God and the life of the church and proffering up other Christians and other people of, faith, of Christian faith, it's all the glory of God. We don't have to agree on every theological purpose and presence, but do we believe in who Jesus is? We believe he died on the cross for my sins and I'm a mess and I need Jesus in my life. If we can show that and imitate it, that's good. When we imitate what's good, we're reflecting what it means to live for Jesus' sake. When we are doing good in the name of Jesus, then others will want to know this Jesus because they see the cause we have. They see the benefit. They see the accounting of it. And most of all, they get it. And they want to share that interest with us. When we're really doing good in the name of Jesus, then others will want to know Jesus. So that's it. In our world today, others need to know this Jesus and what it means. I mean, they need to understand there's only one cause that really matters in our world, and that's Jesus. There's only one benefit that's truly the greatest benefit of all, benefit of all and that's Jesus. There's only one accounting that we need to have, and that's what Jesus is knowing that he died for my sins and makes me clean. And that I have an interest that others know this Jesus. And that interest gets spread.